Hi, how's it going? I'm Bruce Fenton. I'm going to give a, an expanded version of a talk that I've given a couple times on securities tokens. This will be maybe a little bit more organized and in detail. I'll do it in several parts, probably nine parts or so, maybe 10 minutes each, something like that. And I'll do it in a pretty informal way. There's a lot of ground to cover, so I'll jump right into it. So intro to securities tokens. Basically, this was the title of the, the talk that I did in uh, Baltic Honey Badger, Global Ledger Scaling Capacity for Legacy Securities and Systems in, an, in the Age of Atomic Swaps. Uh, I think I just did that to make it sound um, you know, a little bit more advanced than uh, the usual talks that I do, which are something like Cypherpunks and Wall Street or you know, all about Bitcoin or something like that. So uh, that, that I just thought that would be kind of funny. Um, this is a little more detailed version of what we're going to talk about in this uh, short video series. What are programmable and tradable agreements? Uh, agreements are a foundation of free, free market economics and free trade and pretty much everything um, that makes sense in economics, including the way that currencies like Bitcoin interact with the world. And so it should be very, very interesting to cypherpunks and uh, economists, certainly uh, Austrian economists should be interested in capital f formation and the capital markets. Uh, there's a lot of cool things with technology. Um, certainly it can increase the use of Bitcoin as a global money. The next video is going to focus a little bit more on, on, on Bitcoin and its interactions with this and how, why Bitcoiners should be excited about this. It's not a competition to Bitcoin. Uh, we'll talk about how the, the ledgers currently work. This is really important. To understand the problem, why it may or may not work, you really got to understand what the problem is now. And it's not as simple as it may seem. It's very complex. More people are learning about it, but it is very complex and counterintuitive. And it's worth taking a second look at to really understand exactly what is being solved for and why this technology might be able to solve it. And we can talk a little bit about what kind of science can be explored. And, and we'll look at the past, when how these securities came about, what it's like now, what the ledgers are like now. We'll look at the future, what it's going to be like in the future, um, maybe. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, here's a great quote. If you care about Austrian economics or just econ economics in general, certainly the stock market and or just uh, you know, corporations, the idea of any corporation, whether it is a, a tiny foods shop or a multinational, uh, some kind of concept of having stock and having rights and the ability for people to pool resources, share risk, invest, those kind of things are important. Uh, this is why it's important to me. Um, I mentioned this at the, 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 the conference. Um, my mom was a single mom, five kids. She worked very hard, studied economics at night, read Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett and these kind of things, and uh, eventually learned enough, became a stockbroker in 1977 when I was about five years old. Here's me at about 10. I'd go in the office. I kind of grew up there, played with the computer. Uh, I even invested in stocks, at, at, you know, about, you know, certainly by that age. I think I was about eight when I invested in my first stock. Kind of grew up there. Um, would read the pink sheets. This is some scenes from some movies. This is sort of, you know, very, very accurate about what it looked like. And I eventually had odd jobs there. Um, I had different licenses over the years. I got um, re really fully into the industry at age 19, continued on for many years in some different capacity, and eventually kind of evolved into more of a, uh, you know, big picture advisor for different, uh, you know, large pools of money, that kind of thing. And then I got into, uh, you know, really interested in crypto and the economics behind crypto some years ago. So there's a lot of common objections to this sort of concept about tokenized securities, uh, you, you know, that a database is more efficient. That's certainly true, uh, but the database doesn't quite solve exactly what we're solving for. I'm going to get into that in a couple of videos where I talk about how settlement works now. It really may not be how you think. It's worth a second look. Hopefully you can look at that video and see that uh, a database this is what we have now. It just can't work, and I'll show you. The, a lot of the problems about why that is. Uh, Non-native assets can't be recognized on the blockchain. That's that's true. There, there may be some ways to do it, and there's some that would argue that, but certainly for, for, for argument's sake, sure, yeah, that's right. But you don't need it to. Um, paper can't recognize a non-native agreement. Paper doesn't recognize anything except maybe glue or tape or ink, but it doesn't know what the ink says. Yet paper can be used as a tool by the real world or the non-computer world uh, to say that something represents something. So you can have a legal agreement, which I've demonstrated, and I can demonstrate in some of these videos, um, where you can have a legal agreement that says, if, if Alice gives Bob uh, this Bitcoin address, Bob owes her 10% of this company. And that would be a legal agreement that would be enforceable in the country that they have. Bitcoin may not care. Bitcoin uh, fans may not care. Holders may not care. But Bob and Alice can care. And the court system or a uh, smart contract or whatever that they choose to use could care. Um, 
or maybe it doesn't care. That's between Bob and Alice. Uh, if it's if it's between Microsoft and, and Apple, it could be worth billions of dollars. Maybe it's stupid, maybe not. That's the market's job to decide. Who knows? And even actually, this is something I've been thinking about recently. I used to be really all about it's the strength of the chain, the strength of the chain. But I realized, you know, strength of the chain is going to be built into market risk. And if a chain sort of, even if even if the diehard security people say that it's luck, if it lucks out consistently, it could build momentum and people uh, put value on that chain. The market's going to going to place chain risk just like they look at jurisdictional risk. So the market's going to say, okay, there's this chain, this chain, this chain. Bitcoin's very secure. Um, that'll be figured in if if this sort of trading of of agreements and and contracts and tokens that represent something in the world of contracts, which is where all these all these all this value is anyway. You know, Bitcoin doesn't become the value of corporations. You know, this value of corporations and stocks is out in the world. Which is why the third thing, you know, all alts may fall to do. That may be true depending on how you define alts. But if you have a real corporation with real value and it puts um, a contract in the world that says this token, you know, possessor of this token, it's a bearer asset or something like that that represents this other asset. Well, that does have value. It, can, it, it, it cannot fall to zero unless uh, the 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 company's assets fall to zero and that wouldn't happen if the if the company has value i mean you can't argue that all companies who ever do this will all fall to zero you know what if uh, ibm did it you know what if apple did it there's some large companies that could potentially do something like this even a tiny company if they have a million dollars in assets it stays a million dollars in assets then theoretically that token could not fall b below zero now you could have something where you say it's on a bad chain maybe the chain gets broken or whatever but these are centralized anyway so that party would just you know reissue it and that's horrifying if you think about it from a currency standpoint oh my gosh that's terrible you have a central authority deleting coins and reissuing them or yeah well okay but this isn't a currency this is a centralized thing it's all we're looking at is something that's significantly better than the current system of shares better than paper shares better than than what was out there so there's a lot of common objections and there's more than this and we'll get into some of those and uh, explain I think you know like I said the, the objections are valid all of these things make a lot of sense but I think if we explain more about how this will work how this might unfold then maybe people look at it from a different angle so this series this is about one video each there's this one which is intro to securities tokens and then we'll talk uh, the next video i'm going to talk a little bit about about bitcoin i think this should be exciting for bitcoiners if you believe bitcoin will be the global reserve currency you, that's going to need to interact with global stocks and uh you know maybe it'll go into the old clunky systems and you'll have bitcoin in each country in these weird silos i don't think so i think it'll be tokenized and we'll have a market that looks more like you know trading on the on the exchanges that trade bitcoin now only it's uh, real securities representing uh, you know, r real companies with real terms and assets, and that could be very exciting, and it should be of interest to Bitcoiners. And, and even if it's not, it will still affect Bitcoin if assets are issued using counterparty or similar uh, tools on top of Bitcoin, and there's interaction with atomic swaps, and it will affect Bitcoin whether uh, you're interested in it or not. Uh, it certainly seems to be the way that it's going. And also from a chain security standpoint, one reason I'm really interested in Bitcoin is because it is such a secure chain. And uh, if you care about th this kind of thing, then maybe you want to encourage this to be on the Bitcoin chain rather than another chain. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how you analyze these digital assets, why it's different than currency, why currency and securities are completely different thing. They're not competing against each other. Securities tokens are not a scam. Securities are agreements and agreements could be good or bad, ranging from the very worst agreements ever made to the best agreements ever made. You know, certainly if uh, Bill Gates wrote a thing that said, boy, I love this token stuff and I'm feeling generous, I'll give you 50% of my net worth, here's a token. Um, well, that's a good agreement. Um, and that would have value. Uh, if somebody is a scam, uh, they could dress it how up they want and it uh, it won't have value. That's for the market to decide. And that's what agreements are. So we'll talk about more about that. What is a security? I'll talk a really cool story about the first security, uh, the Dutch East India Company, how markets rise, how they work. And more. Mo this is probably the most important one, how settlement works today. So that'll be what, I don't know, seven down or something, how settlement works today, how these entities like DTTC and CD and Co and everything, how they all work today. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the alternative for that. Why a, a blockchain, blockchain-like solutions 
may be inevitable or certainly are possible solutions to this thing. And I, and I know people are skeptical. I'm hopefully going to explain why that might be. And then the last one, I'll get into what I think is really exciting, what the future might look like. Smart contracts and other things might make even this exciting revolution um, uh, mo even more exciting and some of it even obsolete in a few years. It's going to be really, really exciting and, uh, and pretty cool. So hope you watch and uh, I hope it's interesting. Thanks.